I'd like to introduce now our next speaker who was a special guest. Uh, when I look at the experience of the history of software development, I, I see a lot of reinventing the wheel. Uh, we keep rediscovering the same things that we discovered 10 years, 20 years ago. And I think this comes from one main reason. The reason is that we don't really collaborate with academia enough. Uh, there are things that happen there, experiments that they do, things that they find out that we don't take and apply into our daily work. And last year we had Professor Radu Marinescu from Kimishara who gave us a bit uh, of introduction into these things. And this year we really wanted to have somebody from academia who can talk about the experiments in software development. So please greet uh, Feline who will talk about this. Thank you. I'm assistant professor at Delft University of Technology. I know you have the feedback door, but if you would prefer to give me feedback on Twitter, or just shout out that you, what you like, what you don't like, what I'm talking about, this is my Twitter handle, it's at Felina. So feel free to mention me so I can read what you tweeted about me later. So, science. We all love science, right? This Facebook page. Oh, no, it's slow. Okay, this Facebook page has like 13 million links. Everyone really loves science. Also, computer scientists, they love crazy scientific experiments like this. Or this, it's an actual master thesis about the grammar of lol speak. Isn't that cool? That's like, that. this is the science we love. It's, it's fun, you can share it on Facebook. But, but what about real science? What about... How does, what is science? Let's look at that first. Science is a systematic and testable approach to gather knowledge. So it's about experiments, how do you design, how do you really analyze things. So a question we could answer for instance is what programming language is the best programming language? If we would do that with science, how it should be testable, it should be systematic. But if we look at how these type of debates usually go, you would expect, you know, a civilized debate. Yeah, I really love C Sharp. Oh, that's fine, sir, but I really prefer Java because you are some arguments. That's what you expect. But if you go out there in reality or on the web, it's really more like this. It, it's not even this. It's not even two people fighting. It's really <laughs> opinions everywhere. Everyone has an opinion on everything. But science, uh, systematic, uh, testable. <laughs> not, not really. So there are a few things we can do and in this talk I'd like to share with you a few scientific experiments that have recently been done in software engineering to try to address questions like what programming language is best, what really works for people in the field. So here's something you could do if you want to know what programming language is best. You could, you could ask people. You could ask people to give their opinion and also explain why they have this opinion. So there are two researchers at Berkeley that did this. They asked people to pick a few programming language from a list of uh, 51, I think, programming languages. Ones that they really knew they were comfortable with. And then they asked a few questions about those languages. like. Uh, how quick can you learn them? Why did you choose this particular language? And it was a pretty successful survey. It got 13,000 responses. So that's really a lot enough, you could say, to draw some, some statistical conclusions from. So here's, what you see here is the result from this survey. The reasons for picking a certain so language for a given project. So if you look at this, I think what I think is particularly interesting about this graph is that the first aspect that really has something to do with language, with the language, is here, it's on the sixth place, is performance. All the others above that, it's not really about language features, it's about people. What do people like? What does my team know? What's there? What libraries are there? It's really not about those things that we talk about, like parentheses and double isses versus triple isses. It's about team and people. So I think that's really an interesting result of this survey. Another one is development speed and there, all the way almost at the bottom, only 30% of the respondents say that 
specific language features were really, inter uh, really a factor for them in choosing a particular language. So, pop quiz. What correlates the most with programming enjoyment? This was also a result from this survey. What makes a programming language really, really enjoyable? Any guesses? The syntax, well, it's, it's pretty warm, okay, I will tell it's expressiveness. So programmers in this study said that what makes programming really fun, what makes people enjoy a language a lot, is if the language is really, really expressive. So that leads to another interesting question. Could we measure then expressiveness? If we want to know what language is the most expressive, how would we know? How can we know what's expressive? People have an opinion on that, they say, yeah, Haskell is more expressive than JavaScript. How do we know? So there was a researcher at Redmond that tried to measure the expressiveness of different programming languages. This is uh, the table. I don't have the programming languages here yet. I will first explain you uh, what this says. So what he did was he said, well, let's look at a, a large number of code bases and his assumption was that every commit is more or less the same value in terms of meaning. If you do a commit, it's always like one feature or one improvement or one refactoring. So if you compare, compare the commit size of different languages, if you do that for a lot of projects, for a lot of programming language, you can see that the languages that you typically have larger commits in terms of lines of code are less expressive than the ones that have lower lines of code per commit. The very expressive side. Brain fog. <laughs> I don't think it's on the list. They limit it to like things that are actually used in reality. <laughs> Functional languages. Ah, oh, that's a pretty good guess. So what's here? What's what's very Gobol. I don't remember. Let's see if I don't remember if it was on the list. Assembly. No, it was Fortran. Is the, yeah. So the, the colors, by the way, the colors indicate the popularity of the languages. So red is very popular, uh, blue is middle, and black is uh, not so commonly used. So again, here it's very, very interesting. Developers say that expressiveness is what they like, but if you look at what's actually used, all the popular language are at the high end of the expressive, so they are not so very expressive, they're very verbose. So in a sense, this sort of corroborates the first finding of the uh, study, that even though expressiveness makes it fun, it's not actually so important in picking a language. And the guy that said functional, yeah, that's sort of true. Here's Haskell, uh, F-sharp, Erlang, if you say that li the lisps are functional, then they're also here on this side. So again, it's not really a de definitive answer, but it says something about how people enjoy programming languages versus what's actually used in re reality. And in their study, there was, I think, seven and a half million project months over all the programming languages. So really a lot of data. And this entire data set, by the way, is online. So uh, if you want to play with it, if you want to try to find your own favorite language, maybe BrainFrog is in there, then you can download it. I'll put a, a version of these slides on my website with all the links to, uh, to the papers and the websites. So something else that came out of this study is you people, real developers out there, they really don't believe in static typing. Only 36% of people believe static typing has a value and only 8% of people think that static typing has a value for finding bugs. I think that's sort of depressing. It's this very, very low, very low belief that static typing works. So again, can we measure it? Could we measure whether static typing really works? Are the people in this study, are they right or are they wrong? Let's see. Here's a guy, a researcher in Germany, he's called Stefan Hanenberg, and he has done a lot of experiments. Like typing is actually better than dynamic typing. So he did an experiment with, with his students, he divided them into two groups, and the one group had to do the same experiment with a static language, and the other group had to do the same the experiment with a dynamic language. The experiment was they had to make small modification and bug fixing to problems. So let's see how this works in our debating style. So here's 
uh, a lover of dynamic languages. He has undergone some typecasts in his lifetime, so he really believes dynamic typing. And here's his legendary opponent who says, no, 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 static typing is better. So, obviously the first argument of any guy that loves dynamic typing will be, yeah, but typecasts. They are so cumbersome and they took, take time and you do it wrong and it's annoying. All the dots to strings, it makes your code look ugly. Is it really a problem? No. Hadenberg found in his experiments that it really doesn't matter. Only for very trivial programming assignments that are smaller than 10 lines of code, then typecasting gets in the way. But as soon as your programs get any bigger than like 10 lines of code, it doesn't matter anymore because the real complexity is not in dot to string. It's in thinking about your domain, really solving the problem. So don't use this as an argument meant anymore because it doesn't really matter. So then the dynamic typing guy says, yeah, but I can fix errors way quicker because it's all easy and everything happens at runtime. It's really, really untrue, not even close. Here you see the results of an experiment. Blue is, um, is uh, the dynamic language and green is a static language. And then this is the time it took the students until the bug was fixed. So you see it's, it's so much quicker and it's so much more consistent to solve problems in a static language and in a dynamic language. And what was interesting was that often the point at which the the people from the dynamic group ran into trouble when the runtime error occurred. It happened at the same line of code where the compiler said, hey, there's a type error here. So it really saved a lot of time that you don't have to compile and interpret the result. Just the compiler says, you know, probably something's off here. So no, it's not as quick. He has a lot of other results, dynamically typed APIs. They had, he must be very quick to use because you don't have to use the types, you don't have to learn the types, you can just import everything and get going. It's not true. Static APIs are way easier to learn. Even if you add documentation to the dynamic APIs, still the static is, version is better. Turns out that static name types, the names of the types already add more information than just reading the documentation. Not even a, be a better I IDE, it won't help you even if you have an IDE that supports you still. There's really nothing much you can do. So all in all, over the 10 experiments that Stefan Hanenberg has performed so far, he says it looks like at least Java-like static type systems really, really help. If dynamic languages have any benefit over static languages, it's not because they don't have a type system. It's probably in spite of the fact that they don't have a type system. So here's another experiment. An interesting question. Do design patterns work? We've all heard lectures, I guess, talks, sessions, read books about design patterns. They're really, they help you program. Maybe you believe it, maybe you don't believe it. Well, I don't care about whether you believe it or not. Let's try to do some science on it. So here's a scientist, Walter Tickey. He did an experiment on trying to understand whether design patterns actually work. So again, a similar setup to what Stefan Hanenberg did. Two groups of people, one group does something with design patterns and the other group does it without design patterns. A small maintainability uh, assignment and then you figure out who, what group does best. So his first experiment wasn't actually with two systems where one had design patterns and where one didn't have design patterns because in the early days it was quite hard to come up with two equivalent versions of a program where one had design patterns and the other didn't. It's quite hard to do that. So he thought, let's start with a simpler experiment first where the same program was used in the two groups, but in the one group people got documentation. So they said, hey, this is the observer pattern and here's the code. And the other group got the same code, but they didn't get the information, this is the observer pattern. They just got the source code. And of course you can't repeat that experiment with the same people because if I see this source code without documentation and then I get the documentation, well, that's still fine. But if I first get the code and it says, hey, this is a pattern, and then I get the code without, then, then I still know it. So they used a counterbalanced design where students got, first they got um, four groups with pattern documentation and then without on a different program, and here the same, 
and here students first got without documentation and now with. This was also to investigate whether, whether there was some sort of learning, uh, a learning uh, behavior because if I get a program with documentation first and then another program without, I might think, oh, this is about patterns. So this is why the groups were divided into four. So here are the results. You can see somewhat clearly that having pattern documentation helps because twice as much students got the results correctly. So they managed to finish the maintainability tasks in a correct way. There were some interesting issues regarding time though. You see that the people with pattern documentation, it took them a little bit more time on average. Well, obviously they had to read through the documentation, but also the comparison was a little bit unfair because here the time is compared both the students that did it correctly, but also the time of students that did it incorrectly. So if you compare the time of students, only the, the good solutions, only the best solutions, you see that the people with pattern documentation did it also a, li a little bit faster. So in subsequent experiments, they didn't do this anymore. They only calculated time as the only variable, and they made sure that everyone had correct answers using unit tests. So it's a little bit more fair because here you have two confounding variables, both correctness and time. So it's, it's not a very clean experiment. But we can conclude, at least this is what Walter Tiki concludes up till so far, having pattern documentation helps. So now he went on to do a, a somewhat more real experiment where they had two different versions of the same problem, the same program, one with and one without, document, uh, without patterns. The setup here was a little bit different. They did this experiment not with students anymore, but with people at a company. And at that time, it was in the early 2000s, not everyone at companies was so familiar with design patterns. So what they did is they did a pre-experiment first, the same setup as the students, so some time for familiarization, just reading the codes. And then again, two programs, two versions, with and without pattern documentation. And then they got a course on design patterns. And then they did the same experiment again. So they also tried to measure does it help if you explain people patterns? Do they need explanation in order for them to really understand uh, what a pattern is all about? So here are the results for the decorator pattern. You see that with the pattern, in both cases, the time is lower. So it's easier to do maintainability tasks if you look at code that has a design pattern. And it's interesting because for the decorator pattern, you see, the difference between pre-test and post-test aren't that big. So you could say that having the course about design patterns for the decorator pattern, it, it didn't really help anything, which is a good thing. It, it shows that it's so intuitive, you don't even need a course to understand this pattern. It, this doesn't have, hold for any pattern though. Here you have the results for the observer pattern, which is well, somewhat more complicated than the decorator pattern. And here you see the effects of the course are very, very clear. So before the course, people are not helped by the pattern. It takes them a lot more time because yeah, they, they don't understand. They don't know what's going on. But after the course, you see it's very clear that people are, un they are quicker and they're more consistent in their quickness, which is, I would say this is both a good and a bad result. It's good that we see that patterns work, but also it shows that everyone in your team, everyone that works on your code base needs to, to understand the patterns, either through training or through good documentation on your code, because if they don't understand the patterns, they're actually harmful. So beware if you use patterns, and I think this, this goes for any type of more complicated programming construct, make sure that people in your team understand what's going on or they won't actually be quick. So they work. We can conclude that, but an interesting question is why? Why do design patterns work? Now it's time for my life scientific experience. I would like to have two volunteers, and specific volunteers, I would like to have one that's very, very good at playing chess. Who's very good at, you don't actually have to play chess. There won't be any playing involved, but you have to be a reasonably good chess player. I, we have a room full of computer geeks. I'm sure there must be a good chess player among you. Yes, yeah, yeah, Ooh, round of applause. Uh, 
I'm not very good, so... <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I know What's your name? Dante. Hi. Hi. So please uh, step aside for one second while we find the second volunteer. So given the incredible silence of my previous question, this should be an easy one. Now I'm looking for someone who doesn't know anything about chess. Preferably you don't even know like how the pieces look or what their names are. The less you know about chess, the better. A volunteer, please. <laughs> oh, yes, oh, thank you so much. What's your name? Okay. So I have a little chess board. Yeah, yeah, well, right. It's actually more, more difficult to admit that you don't know something. Okay, so let's go. I have a chess board here. This may be a trap, actually. It's not a, no, it's not a trap. So I have a chessboard here. I've never done this experiment live, by the way, so I don't know it, whether it will work, but we're going to try. So what we're going to do is you have some time, let's say a minute or so, to watch this chess setup. You will watch the white, uh, the white pieces and you will watch the black pieces. You have about a minute. After that, we remove the pieces and you have to reconstruct how the board looked like. <laughs> yeah, you, so you just remember the black, you just remember the white, you look at it, you look at it very go, go, you look at it very as good as you can, try to remember how all the pieces look like. I will make a picture with my phone so we can have, have we have something to compare with later. <laughs> <laughs> what are the odds? I don't know. We will figure out after this experiment what the odds are. He drank last night. Oh, <laughs> confounding factors. He drank last night. <laughs> 20 more seconds. You have time to reconstruct the whole set. To be fair, to be fair, we also mix in all the pieces that were not on the board. <laughs> okay, let's go. Oh yeah, yeah, you can place it here. That's Let's give you about, yeah, another minute to reconstruct as much as possible. Ooh. <laughs> no, no pressure. All for science. Wait, so you're done? Oh, great! Oh, this is good for my experience. Yes, I'm happy. Thank you, man. <laughs> it's as exciting for me as it is for those guys. Okay, thank you. Well, another round of applause for our volunteers. So, I'm actually not going to check the whole setup because, well, we don't have time for that. But this was an experiment that was done in the 70s where good chess players versus normal people had to memorize chess setups. And it turned out that the chess players were a lot, a lot better at it than normal mortals. So, the conclusion that, the conclusion that they drew at that point was, yeah, chess players, they're just so smart. They're just smarter people than, than the rest of us. So, they must have a better memory. And they, they left the experiment at that point. In the 90s, people wanted to replicate the experiment because they were interested in understanding what made the memory of chess players so much better. So what they did was they replicated the experiment, but now not only with normal chess setups, but also with random chess pieces. And then it turned out on the random chess pieces, the chess players weren't any better than everyone you just randomly grabbed off the streets. So it wasn't that their memory was better, it was that they were trained to recognize patterns 
and they memorize the patterns for instance here if you look at the the setup yeah you know that um, a rook is always on the side and you know that um, a queen moves in a certain way or a horse moves in a certain way so you know it can only be at that place so they didn't memorize all the pieces they memorized the patterns and this is exactly the reason why design patterns work if you look at how the human memory works is long-term memory you can memorize a lot but it's very very slow much like a hard drive where short-term memory is super quick but there was research done in the 50s that shows that in your short-term memory you can only memorize seven items at once so if you're looking at programming codes and you see hey this is the observer pattern you only have to remember the observer pattern or in the chess you only have to remember oh it's in this setup or of all the uh, pawns only one was moved so it only takes up one of the spaces in the limited seven spaces you have in your short-term memory whereas if you have to remember oh there's one class and if something happens in that class then the other gets a notification it's like four or five things instead of just an observer pattern so this is why design patterns work because they take less space in your quick short-term memory and that keeps space free for other things to remember like the name of the methods things about the domain where people that don't use the pattern had that space filled up with source code information so experimental design on the design pattern showed that they really work and if you look into previous work that's been done in cognitive science it helps you to understand why it actually works so let's do one more Linus's law. Does it hold? Does anyone know what Linus's law is? No. No. Oh, that's easy. How can you know that no one knows it? That's untrue. <laughs> okay, I, I will give it to you. Linus's law is given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. And this is sort of a advocating open source, saying, hey, if many people look at it, it's open source, everyone can spot a spot a bug and this makes it really really safe but we had some problems with some open source projects lately so maybe other people are not believing the law anymore as well but obviously there are also a lot of success stories so let's see whether it holds we could do another analysis first of all sentiment i'm not the only one who is uh, who's somewhat skeptical about this this was a tweet it was retweeted a lot of times a favorite a lot of times it's true right it's so true if i have to look at my students homework and it's like this assignment for binary search everything is wrong all the variable names are wrong and the indentation is wrong 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 but if i in my company if i have to look at serious source code i have to review a pull request <laughs> fine i trust you i know you're a good pro i don't have time for this so this somewhat illustrates why it might not work because even though many people can look at it do they do they actually look so you might not be impressed with like a tweet as a, as a scientific proof you, you should all be shouting now this is not systematical and testable okay i have some science too luckily there's a beautiful beautiful software package called Windows Vista, I still remember it, fantastic. So one of the things about Vista is that it, it had a lot of bugs. And this was interesting because it allowed users, uh, researchers at Microsoft Research to look into the bugs because if a bug happened, you get the little pop-up, hey, do you want to send this information to Microsoft? And many people did. So they had a really good understanding of what binaries in the system were more error prone than other binaries. They could really understand what binary has a lot of bugs and what binary is, is healthy. And because they were Microsoft researchers, they also had access to the organizational chart of Microsoft. So they knew what people worked in the team with who and they had source control. So they also knew what people worked on what binary. So they could try to guess is there any way we can estimate what binaries will be the most error prone? And it turned out that the opposite of Linus law was true here. The more people touch a specific binary, the more error prone it is. So if you write a thing by yourself, it's perfectly fine. If you write source code, a binary with a thousand people working on it's more error prone so it's not even untrue the opposite of Linus law is true which is it's interesting and it's even 
and be becomes more interesting because organizational metrics like who worked on the code are more tied to code quality than any other metric you can do on source code. So here's a list, even pre-release bugs, huh? this is a hard piece of software before the release it already contains a bug, it's really not so good at estimating the number of bugs, nor is code coverage, the dependency, the code complexity, the churn, it's all not as tied to code quality as the organizational structure is. So who, who, who worked on the bug, but also um, how many different people, how many churn was there in the projects. The best way to estimate how error prone your software is, is not look at the software, but look at how your company is structured and who's working with whom. I think that's pretty amazing because there's a lot of research and many people care about these things a lot. And you do coverage measurements, you do complexity measurements, hey, the McCabe is high, we have to do things. But in the meantime, your boss says, yeah, can you just work on that other team for, for a few weeks? That's the thing that's going to cause bugs. So that's, I think this is, uh, this is food for thought. So one more. All the research I showed you before is not my own research. It's research done by other researchers. And of course here, I also wanted to tell you a little bit about what my own research is about. So my own research that I did my PhD dissertation on and that I still work on is about our spreadsheets code. Can we reasonably say that an Excel spreadsheet is a piece of source code? Do you want to guess? Who's, who's with me? Who says spreadsheets are code? Oh, that's an easy crowd. Okay, so for the ones who don't believe me, I have three arguments that spreadsheets are actually should be considered source code. One, they're used for very similar problems. What you see here is an investment calculation. You put in some inputs, you get some outputs. It's really what you, you can use. You can write this in Java, JavaScript, CoffeeScript, BrainFuck, in any language, and also in a spreadsheet. The problem space is, is really comparable in many cases. Obviously, not in all cases. People make lists in a spreadsheet, but for many cases, it is comparable. Uh, so I go to great lengths to make my points. I went to such great length that I implemented a Turing machine in spreadsheet formulas only. So no VBE, only formulas. It's cool, isn't it? So every, every row is an iteration of the lint, and the yellow box shows where the head of the Turing machine is, how it moves over the lint. So in addition to being proof that Excel formulas are Turing complete, I think it's also a nice visualization of how a Turing machine works. You see how it moves. It's pretty cool. And luckily, I'm not the only one who thinks it's really cool. It somewhat went viral over the internet so much that it brought my website down for a, for a few hours. So at least other people think this is interesting as well. Third of all, and this is what the, the whole content of my PhD dissertation is about, Spreadsheets have really, really similar problems to source code. Here are a few things. Only one in three spreadsheets contain a manual. Sounds familiar? An average spreadsheet is used by 12 different people and an average spreadsheet stays alive for five years. These are typical software engineering problems, the type of problems that we had in, I wouldn't say we've solved them, but at least we addressed them with source control systems and good IDEs. But in spreadsheets, these problems are still very much open. So I go all over the world to talk about my research and I always try to convince people spreadsheets are code and if spreadsheets are code, you can ask yourself, can we apply methods from software engineering to spreadsheets? And my answer is, yes, we can. So I've worked on something like a spreadsheet IDE, a tool for spreadsheet refactoring, a tool for spreadsheet testing, spreadsheet smell detection, all the things we have in software engineering, at least the ones of which we know it works. I try to convert them to spreadsheets to make them more accessible for end users. So that was my entire talk. I think we have some room for questions, but before we go to questions, I will summarize my entire talk in uh, under one minute. So if you have been sleeping so far, you have been hungry, or you came in a bit late, this is your second chance to get the entire talk. And if you were already listening, this will be optimal preparation for question asking. So. Debates on software engineering are often messy like this, which is not really scientific. For instance, a question like what programming language is better, we can ask people and it turns out that the things we usually debate about like syntax 
isn't so important for picking a language. Expressiveness is important for fun, we can measure it, and we see that indeed it's not the most important factor. We could argue about static versus dynamic types, but we could also do an experiment about the experiment showed that actually static is better for many cases. Design patterns, they work. There was a, were experiments done that show that they really work. And cognitive science helps us understand why Linus's law is really not true. The opposite is true. And spreadsheets are code. Yes, spreadsheets are code. So that's it. My entire talk with all the narrative and all the links is on my, on my slide share. If you want to know more, well, you can ask me a question now or later, or I will be around all day, or you can send me a tweet. And if you want to stay up to date with all the software engineering research I was talking about, you can have a look at my website. Often if I go to academic conferences, I post papers and I write about them. So if you want to stay involved, then my website is a great place to start. A question, there. Yeah. Uh, I'm not really confident. Uh, should I wait for the microphone? Uh, yeah. Well, I'm you not... have a second microphone? No, it's okay, I can oh. shout. Yeah, you shout out over here. Um, so I'm not convinced that Linus's law is flawed because uh, you, you've given the example of uh, Linus who works on the Linux kernel, who's, which is an open source. Cannot hear, so. uh, no, I'll repeat oh. if I, if I got So um, you give the example of uh, Linus who works on the Linux kernel. Uh, from my ex uh, experience, uh, all, almost all of the developers that work on the Linux kernel, they have a very powerful motivation for working on that piece of software. So they're very motivated. They're not primarily motivated by money which I believe is the primary source of motivation inside a company as big as Microsoft, uh, which uh, mostly can hire, I mean, they hire the best people, but they hire, because, they hire them because they're best, they have good grades in school and stuff like that. But they're not very motivated at delivery, and they're not very passionate about software. As, uh, I mean, I'm not saying they're not motivated, but yeah. Okay, so, so the question is that Linus's law, he's not convinced by the arguments because this was an industrial case study. Well, so first of all, Linus's law didn't say, P.S., this is only for open source. He says, <laughs> he's never very you know, moderate about things, so he just says this holds for all software. Uh, there were also some experiments done in open source, by the way, looking at how the organizational structure of open source projects is related to bugs. So it's not exactly the same, but it's quite real. Uh, quite similar and there you saw the same result that um, the organization of an open source project looks like the source code of the open source project so teams are related to methods or teams are related to classes but when that's not the case so when you have people that update everywhere they are also more likely to make errors and it's not the case that this doesn't happen even though you're motivated and I think some recent events show that that even though you're motivated, if you don't understand the code very well, you're going to make mistakes, independent of, I think, your salary or your motivation. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah, so oh, my chest friends. Hi. <laughs> uh, related to his question, I don't think it uh, is the same thing. So basically, Lena says, uh, if more people look, uh, they can better spot the defects. So. Because of the open source, they have access to the code. Everybody has access. Well, uh, and who is interested will look. Uh, so it, they have better chances of spotting the defect. Maybe not modify the, the modification of the code. Yes. So I believe if more people modify the same code, then there's more chance to appear. But uh, if more people have access, they have better chance to spot. In a closed organization, only the developer of, of the organization have access to the code. So maybe other bright minds don't have access to see the code and spot, okay, you did, uh, because everybody does mistakes. So I think maybe it's not, there's yeah, not in, a conflict. In theory, this is very much true, obviously. Yeah, open source projects are open to everyone and everyone could look. But if you look at your own experience with open source, I think, in reality, who's really looking at your code are the people that, that modify it. The people that are contributors, the, they are going to look at the pull requests, they are going to accept them, they are going to submit bugs. Maybe your users are going to submit bugs, but that's probably as far as they go. 
I, I haven't encountered so often that your users they go into your code base and say, hey, I found a mistake. So yeah, sure, in theory, uh, it's absolutely true, but in reality, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I believe that uh, related to that statement, because we're talking about it, um, there are a lot of things that contribute to the amount of bugs and uh, defects that are in a code base and not uh, how many people look at it. It's code review if it's done or not, it's uh, all kind of quality processes and so on. Motivation, it's been already mentioned. So. Uh, just the number of people, it's, it's just a statistic. It's not uh, something that uh, proves uh, either side of the story. Yeah, that's true. The only interesting fact that I want to share with, yeah. with this paper is that the things that people typically look at are very technical, like coverage, like complexity, and the, the real problems, and, and you, you sort of say that real problems are often human, like organizational structure, like code reviews, like uh, time pressure. So people tend to be really focused on, I have 100% coverage, or my McCabe is, is, is perfect. But the real problems are in, in humans often. So this is what, what was so interesting for me personally about that paper, is that it shows that organizational metrics not related to, you don't have to look at the source code at all to be able to estimate error proneness, which uh, we agree, I think. It's not technical. Other questions? Okay, then it's time for lunch, I guess. Thank you. Thank you.